Good morning, welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 30th of July and this quick look at the week ahead beginning the 2nd of August with me, Michael Hewson. Before we get started, let's just have a quick look back at the events of the past few days. And after a poor start to the week, markets in Europe managed to pull off their lows as a consequence of two days of fairly strong company updates from the likes of UK banks, oil companies, and obviously some very decent numbers from the US tech giants. And these, these strong earnings updates helped to push the stock 600, the FTSE 250, the S&P 500, the Dow Jones and the NASDAQ to new record highs. However, there does appear to be a little bit of end of week weakness starting to creep in. And I think a large, I think a large part of that is over concern about where equity markets are likely to go to next. Because I think when you actually look at this week's earnings announcements, good as they have been, I think one of the questions is, after a fairly decent first half, will the second half of the year be equally as positive? Um, you know, will European markets be able to sustain a six successive monthly gain and at the moment the jury is a little bit out on that if we say for example look at the FTSE 100 we can see that we are starting to see a little bit of weakness today after the decent gains from Wednesday and Thursday and if we look at the monthly chart there are signs that we're starting to um, top out a little bit with fairly decent support at around about 6,800 whereas we're really struggling to crack above 7150 and 7170 and if we look at say for example similar moves on the german dax it's a similar sort of story when it comes to a little bit of a topping out pattern this is the daily chart we look at the weekly chart or the monthly chart rather and again we've made an incremental new high but it looks as if we could well finish the month lower. And I think that really is the biggest concern going forward, that momentum is starting to um, run out of steam and we could be on the cusp of potentially a little bit of a move towards the downside. Alternatively, we could just continue this sideways range that we've been in over the course of the past few weeks. Um, more worryingly, the Nikkei is showing signs of rolling over. And, and I think that more than anything is a bigger concern, the fact that since February, the lows have been getting, the, lo the highs have been getting lower and the lows have started to get a little bit, the reaction of the lows hasn't been anywhere near as positive. I think the big level on the, on the Nikkei is around about 27,000, 27,100. That's going to be, I think, a very key level over the course of the next few days. If we break below that, then we could well see further weakness in the Nikkei 225. And I think a lot will depend on um, the after effects of this week's events in China. Um, markets in Europe, I think, have opened, have opened, obviously opened lower today, seen a little bit of end of week weakness, end of month weakness. There was some talk that Chinese regulators were softening their positioning on regulation over concerns about the extent of the recent sell-off that we've seen in Chinese markets. And if that is their intention in softening the position, softening the rhetoric, it doesn't appear to be working. Um, the reality is I think the recent crackdown by China has let the genie out of the bottle and confidence appears to have shifted. So I think people will be reluctant to put money back into Chinese markets or those stocks that are particularly exposed to Chinese regulatory scrutiny without China putting a little bit of meat on the bones of what they were outlining or what they were indicating in a recent commentary. The damage to confidence may be an awful lot harder to repair um, given recent events. So we're coming into August against a backdrop of a little bit of uncertainty about the regulatory um, framework in China. Obviously, the really 
bumper earnings announcements that we've seen from the likes of Microsoft, um, um, Apple and Alphabet were very, very positive, but it's prompted the question, how does how do they improve on that? And obviously Amazon's numbers came in below expectations, even so they still managed to post three successive quarters of revenues well in excess of $100 billion. So I suppose it really depends on your perspective. I think when we're talking about tops and bottoms, highs and lows and what have you, let's just look at the price action. And the price action is telling me that we're in a range. If we basically knock that trend line out there, the bottom of that range for the FTSE 100 is 6,800, fairly decent support. The top of that range is anywhere in between 7,150 and 7,170. So at the moment, we're still in a bit of a range. The S&P 500 is still very much in its uptrend, even if there is a per perception that we could roll back down to this line here. The highs are still getting higher. The lows are still getting higher. So US markets still remain in an uptrend. So at the moment, there are no signs that um, the, bu the bubble, as it is, if you whatever, whatever, however you want to describe it, is starting to look if it's going to pop. So um, at the, for the time being, it's pretty much as you were, continue to play the range. Now, obviously, if we look at the NASDAQ, we've seen a very sharp reversal there. And there is a concern that the extent of that fall, we really need to see the NASDAQ start to make new highs. So the key support for me on the NASDAQ is this low here. It's around about 14,780. If we break below that, then obviously that then opens up this low down here. Let's not forget, it's basically the trend is your friend. So when we're following and looking at what markets are looking to do, basically just watch the underlying trend. So there's my trend line for the NASDAQ. If we break below that line, then we could well see a sharper correction towards the downside. And that is important in technical analysis. When all else fails, stick with the technicals because they are the, the best arbiter I think, in terms of market direction. Now, we've seen a big week for dollar weakness, and that's significant as we look ahead towards the payrolls report, which is coming up on the 6th of August. And that, that's going to be my main focus, I think, over the course of the next few days. It's the June payrolls report, but it's July payrolls report, particularly given the fact that US second quarter GDP came in 2% below expectations. You know, it came in at 6.5%. Now, that's not too shabby. Uh, under normal circumstances. Unfortunately, we're not living in normal circumstances. There's a pandemic raging. And the expectation was we'd get an 8.5% expansion. Moreover, weekly jobless claims aren't coming down anywhere near as fast um, as you'd like them to come down. They're still anchoring around 400,000. But when you've got 9 million vacancies in the US economy, you've got to ask yourself why those vacancies aren't getting fulled filled even. And I think that's one of the key concerns that the Federal Reserve has with respect to the US labor market and which is causing them to be very, very dovish when it comes to the recent rise in um, CPI, PPI and PCE, inflationary pressures. Now, the June jobs report turned out to be a much better report than expected on the headline number. And that's what I mean, the headline number was much better. 850,000 jobs. It's a decent improvement, but it didn't tell us too much about the overall state of the US labor market in terms of how quickly those US workers who've dropped out of the workforce since February last year are likely to come back. So what do I mean by that? Well, the US participation rate remained unchanged at 61.6%. Um, that's still almost 2% below where it was pre-pandemic, 63 0.4%. So when you translate that into real numbers, that's 7 million people who are no longer in the labor force looking for work, the participation rate. And, you know, when are they going to come back? And I think that's the big unknown. We know that New York Fed President John Williams is one member concerned about the lackluster rebound in the participation rate. It has rebounded, from the lows of the pandemic when it was around about 60.3%, 61.6, but it still remains below the levels that we saw in February 2020. So I think in an effort to 
prompt more workers back into the workforce. Um, some US states are phasing out already some of the emergency benefits brought in as a result of the pandemic and in, in an attempt to force more people back to work. Now, all of these benefits expire in September. So we should get a better indication there. Hopefully, as Delta variant cases start to roll over and vaccine rates increase. But at the moment, the US is experiencing a pandemic of the unvaccinated, and that's holding back economic activity. So I think the big question is how many of these 7 million have retired early and no longer intend to come back? How many have set up their own businesses? Uh, and how many intend to come back to the workforce? And quite simply, it's too early to know the answer to that question. And I think that really reflects why the Federal Reserve was as non-committal this week um, when it came to any type of discussion about a tapering debate and in terms of the amount of tapering because $120 billion a month is quite a lot. But even if you reduce it by 20 billion, it sends a signal that the process is starting, but they can reduce it by 10 billion a month and it can still go on um, the extra asset purchases for another 12 months after that. So I think the tapering debate is a little bit of a red herring more than anything else. Um, and I think one of the things that Powell said this week was quite interesting when he said the Fed is a ways away from raising interest rates which you know sort of flies in the face of what Bostick and Bullard are saying that they expect to see a rate rise by the end of next year. We'll just have to wait and see. We just don't know. And that will explain why the dollar has come off as much as it has over the course of the past week. And that's simply on the basis that weaker economic data, GDP weaker, jobless claims slightly higher, and it's pushed back actually the tapering but tapering discussion potentially towards the end of this year, probably at the earliest, and as a result, the dollar is weaker as a consequence of that. And that's why US Treasury yields are now at 125 and um, well below 1.5%. And we can look at the trend here. You know, it's quite clear the US 10 year yield is around about 124, it's down two basis points on the day. You've also got it's well above the, the lows of 112.60 on the 20th of July, but the direction of travel here is quite clear. Lower highs, lower lows, the trend for US yields on the long end appears to be lower. And that's probably not gonna be so great for US investment banks returns in terms of the yield curve. The yield curve is starting to flatten again. So that is gonna be a worry, certainly I think in terms of bank earnings more broadly. We've also got a Bank of England meeting next week i'm not really expecting too much from that despite the recent hawkishness from deputy governor dave ramsden um, when he became one of the first um, mpc members to break ranks um, on a pairing bank a pairing back even of monetary stimulus i think with the departure of andy haldane as chief economist there was an expectation that the mpc would dissolve into groupthink and basically just sign off um, the status quo in terms of monetary policy um, until the end of the year. Now we've got two Bank of England policymakers breaking ranks in the last few weeks to question the merits of current policy by articulating the prospect that the asset purchase programme might need to be reined in. Now perhaps we shouldn't have been too surprised by Dave Ramsden's um, being the first to break ranks because his comments um, about negative rates a year ago suggested he was less than keen on the prospect. I'll give you a clue, he's not the only one. But um, I think his comments that the case for considering the pairing back of stimulus and measures was, was noteworthy. It acknowledges the vaccine program has potentially changed the game. And it was also notable that he was joined by external MPC member Michael Saunders in expressing rising concern at how transitory or otherwise inflation levels we're likely to be. Now, infection rates are starting to fall in the UK at the moment, and obviously that is encouraging. Um, Hospitalisations are continuing to edge a little bit higher, so there appears to be a little bit of a disconnect there. Um, so I think the big question, I think, as we look ahead towards the Bank of England policy decision on Thursday, the 5th of August, is while there's little likelihood of a change in policy at this meeting, it will be noteworthy to see if there is any dissent 
on the pace of the bond buying program and whether bank, the bank will look at slowing the pace of it. Nonetheless, the big level on cable is this 140 level here. I've outlined it with this red line all the way across the top here. So if we are to trade higher on cable, then we need to break above 140.20 in the short to medium term. We certainly have seen some sterling strength when it comes to euro sterling. But once again, we're finding decent buying in and around that 85 area. Um, and then just below that, we've got support at 84.80. So we're range trading on euro sterling in the same way that we've been range trading on the FTSE 100. The big, the big support is around about 84.70, interim at 85. And then we've got resistance at 86.40 and 87.30. So you really pays your money and you take your choice when it comes to euro sterling. In terms of other economic data, we do have services PMIs for July. Um, the latest flash PMIs from both the UK and the US saw surprise falls in both during July. And I think the main reason for the UK services activity decline to 57.8 was a direct consequence of the so-called pandemic. I hate that expression. But I mean, I suppose it really just um, quite elegant, elegantly disguise, it describes the problem that businesses are having with respect to economic activity self-isolating due to being pinged by the NHS track and trace app. Business optimism about the economy is also declining as a consequence of that. Having said that, pandemic restrictions will be, will be eased on the 16th of August so that fully vaccinated people won't have to isolate if they are pinged by the track and trace app. Sadly, there's still an, at least another two to three weeks to go before that comes into effect. Um, so those are the key economic indicators that we've got next week. In terms of the earnings announcements, we've got a fairly decent, uh, we've got a we've got a report from HSBC, first half numbers from HSBC, following on from the really good numbers that we saw from Barclays, Lloyds and NatWest, um, seeing a resumption of dividend payments and buybacks from uh, NatWest and Lloyds. And what, we, what we've also seen is um, all three banks recycle um, reserves from non-performing loans back into the profits. Uh, and that is very, very welcome because it suggests that they're much more optimistic about um, the outlook for the UK economy going forward. Um, in terms of share price performance, there hasn't been much to cheer about for HSBC shareholders, as you can see from this graph here. We've broken below the 200 day moving average. We're in a downtrend. We found a little bit of support at around about 390. But to be quite honest, the rebound looks fairly feeble. So I think this week's first half numbers um, should be fairly indicative as to whether or not um, we've seen a proportionate pickup in its UK business. I think we should have it fairly. They, you know, there was a fairly decent um, there was a fairly decent amount of profits generated in Q1 for the UK business of one billion dollars. Um, certainly, Barclays, Lloyds and NatWest have shown some fairly decent returns from their UK businesses, so you would expect the UK do the same. Um, in the first quarter, it reported income of $5.8 billion, um, a decent increase on the same quarter last year. Um, most of the profits came from the Bank's Asia business. So given the turmoil that we've seen in Asia over the course of the past quarter in terms of the stock markets, it'll be interesting to see whether or not that will be sustained. In Q1, the bank recycled $400 million of last year's $8.8 .8 billion of loan loss provisions back onto the balance sheet. So I'll be looking for evidence as to whether or not they feel confident enough to add to that recycling of funds. And the Global Banking and Markets Division also had a decent Q1. Though given the poor performance from US banks, I wouldn't expect to see too much in the way of ripping up trees as a consequence of Q2. So I think HSBC has a very big bar to get over to break the downtrend that it's been in over the course of the past few weeks since those peaks at the end of May, beginning of June. Um, which brings us on to BP. Um, Royal Dutch Shell posted some fairly good numbers last week. If we look at BP, we can see BP shares have been remarkably unimpressive in terms of their overall performance since June. You would think that with oil prices up near three-year highs that BP share price would reflect that. It hasn't. Um, its outlook for a cash flow surplus is based on an oil price 
of $45 a barrel. And yet we hear, yet here we are at $75 a barrel. I think there's an awful lot of investor skepticism uh, on the part of investors about BP's um, uh, going green plan. Um, if we look at, in terms of profits, BP reported underlying replacement cost profit of $2.6 billion in Q1, best performance since 2019. Um, better refining margins, higher oil prices, company says it's looking to resume buybacks. Obviously, Shell announced a $2 billion buyback uh, last week. BP did say that cash flow in the second quarter would be impacted by its $1.2 billion Gulf of Mexico. Um, payment so that could impact its numbers for Q2. Um, it could be it could be that shareholders aren't convinced that the plans for a 40% reduction in oil and gas production is any way practical or achievable without hammering its margins and I think that's maybe why we've seen the decline in the share price since June. Transition towards green energy is likely to be expensive. Um, we know that um, having invested into wind power leases in the RFC, it's clear what the direction of travel is, while light source is also delivering on its projects. For now, the performance of the share price would suggest that the jury remains out. So I think as the numbers, when the numbers come out on Tuesday, it'll be interesting to note whether or not we see further declines towards the lows that we saw in the middle of July. It's certainly worth keeping an eye out for. I'm going to finish up with Rolls-Royce. It's been absolutely hammered by the pandemic, given the fact that it relies on servicing airline jet engines for about 50% of its revenue. And as planes haven't been flying, it hasn't been getting any revenue. Has been has seen a little bit of a rebound off its July lows. Um, been a fairly uneventful three months for the Rolls-Royce share price. Again, much will depend on whether or not the aviation sector is able to get off the ground um, in terms of resuming some level of normal flights. Now, with British Airways already saying that it's only going to be planning um, around about 40% of capacity transatlantic over the course of the next, uh, over the rest of the year, that does not seem likely. And Rolls-Royce is expecting um, engine flying hours for this year to come in around about 55% level from six months ago. That number is starting to look ever more doubtful as we head into year end. So I think for me, when you've got EasyJet saying that they only saw Q3 flying 17% of their overall capacity, I think we do need to be prepared potentially for a guidance uh, change um, at um, this week's numbers for Rolls-Royce but have a you know have keep keep a close eye on the lows that we've seen back in January and back in July personally I think we're probably likely to continue to try stay in the range that we've been in over the course of the past few months other items to keep an eye out for this week are Uber's latest numbers potentially AMC Entertainment Q2 numbers depending on who you believe their numbers could be out on the 4th of August 5th of August or the 6th of August um, at the moment, there's no potentially confirmed date for that, but they are due. We've got games maker Activision Blizzard. They've had a fairly good year on the back of the fact that people have been staying home, buying games and playing games on their consoles. Um, we've got Uber and we've got Beyond Meat. So that's it for this week. Once again, thank you very much for listening to my ramblings this week. Speak to you all the same time, same place next week. And don't forget to tune in to Non-Farm Payrolls on Friday, the 6th of August at 1.15, where I'll be covering numbers live as they hit the tape. Thank you very much.